Praise the Lord, Anchor Church. It's good to be here in the house of the Lord tonight with all of you wonderful people. And uh, you, we've already prayed. You can go ahead and sit down tonight. It's good to see a good crowd on Wednesday at Bible study. I'm excited about what's going to happen in Zanesville, aren't you? And I'm here to encourage you about it tonight. I'm going to read in Matthew, the fourth chapter, the 18th verse, if you want to turn there, Matthew 4 and 18, very familiar passage of scripture, Matthew 4 and 18, and Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you, does anybody know what it says? Fishers of men. And Mark said it this way, And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Sounds like to me, if you're not fishing, you're not following. It's pretty pretty cold, isn't it? <laughs> but it is true. We, he, the first commandment that he gave the disciples was, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And I know the Bible teaches us to be holy even as he is holy, right? I believe he wants us to be just. I want to be just, don't you? I want to be righteous because the Bible says the just shall live by faith. So he's calling believers people that are just. And the Bible says that Lot was a just man. He was a just man. And I preached one time here that I want to be just like Lot, but I don't want to be just like Lot. <laughs> that was a long time ago, but I still want to be just like Lot, but I don't want to be exactly like Lot because Lot was not a soul winner. I want to be a soul winner. I've always tried to be a soul winner, from the time I started preaching or even before, I would bring people to the house of the Lord because I know this is the place where they can get ready to meet the Lord. And it's important that, uh, that we deliver the message to everybody that we can. And one of the reasons we have the Holy Ghost, the Bible says in Acts 1 and 8, and ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. When it comes up on you, you're going, you should be a witness. You remember when the lepers were outside the city because they weren't allowed to come in? And, and they said, well, let's go down to the camp of the Midianites because they have food there. If we go in the city, they don't have any food. They're starving. They were eating dove's dung. How'd you like to make a bowl of soup out of dove's dung? I'd have to be awful hungry. How about you? There's things in the restaurants people people are that they eat. I could no way in the world eat it. My wife eats things I can't eat. She can eat liver and cottage cheese and oysters and a lot of you probably like that, but I can't hardly stand for cottage cheese to be on the table. <laughs> but a horse's head? They said, no need to go in there. I don't blame them. They said, well, if we go in the camp of the enemy, what can they do, kill us? We're dead men walking already. And, and you know the story how they went down and God made it sound like an army of soldiers coming and they didn't even climb on their horse. They just ran, left their clothes, left their, their riches and left all the food and, and they walked into a camp that was just completely full of everything anybody would want in that day and time. And one, after they ate all they could eat, and they hid garments and jewels and gold, they said, you know what? We do not well if we do not tell. And that's true today. We have something better, more precious than gold. And if we just keep it to ourselves, we're not doing very good. But he called us to be a witness for the kingdom. Now I'm here to teach a lesson tonight, but I feel the preacher in the house. And there's a right way to do it. The Lord came to Simon Peter. One time Simon Peter, he said, I go a fishing. And they said, we're going to go with you. 
And so Jesus came, stood on the shore and said, have, have you caught any meat? And they said, no, we've toiled all night, hadn't caught anything. He said, well, cast your net on the other side. And he, he said, we've toiled all night, taken nothing, but nevertheless at thy word. They threw it over on the other side, and there was so many fish, it was about to break the net and sink the ship, sink the boat, so they had to call the little boats in to, to help them carry all the catch to shore. You see, there's a right way. And there's a wrong way. You know what the definition of insanity is? If you do the same thing over and over and over and expect a different outcome, that's just crazy. And I've known people that's pastored that way for years. And they still don't have anybody. They didn't have anybody 35 years ago because they're just doing the same thing. If I can't make it happen one way, I'm going to try another way. I've been to seminar after seminar since I became a church planter, trying to glean from people that knew how to plant a church. I remember the first one I went to, and the director was a friend of mine, and he had some people teaching the seminar. One had about 10 in his church. I think one had about 20 in his church, and another maybe 30. And I said, you know, won't you bring somebody in to teach a seminar that's actually build a church. I don't want to know how not to build a church. Well, I guess it is a good thing to know. I have seen people do things, and I thought, I'll never do what they've done because I've seen how destructive it's become. But I want to, I want to observe people that, that have done it, that have built churches and, and been a soul winner because there's a right way to do it. Praise God. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Man, we have a great commission. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. That's called the great commission. We're to go to the whole world. Somebody asked, my son David, when he was in Parkersburg, said, how are you going to reach this city? And he said, I'm going to baptize one of them at a time. Praise God. One at a time. And I think they just crossed the 900 mark that they've baptized. Praise God. That's the way you do it, one at a time. Brother Jay took over Ripley Church after I when I retired, and I think he said he's baptized 26 in the last six months. Praise God. That's, that's the way you do it. One at a time. I heard a story years ago about a little boy who was walking down the beach, and he was picking starfish up and throwing them, and, and they were everywhere. And the guy said, what are you doing? You're not, you're not making, having any effect on them. He, said, he pitched one in the water and said, I made one on that one. Sometimes it seems we're overwhelmed, but I'm telling you what, if we just keep winning one at a time, if everybody in here won one, we would have a tremendous crowd in here. But God has called us to be witnesses. An old farmer was sitting on the porch and a man passed by, and, and he said, man, what a beautiful farm God has here. And he said, you ought to have seen it before, before when God had it all by himself. God's not going to hoe a garden. He's not going to till the ground. He's not going to sow the seed. No, but he's called people to do the work. And I don't want, to, I've heard people say, well, when God, no, God's waiting on you and me. He wants us to quit dreaming and put our dreams into action. A dream is only a dream until you wake up and put it into action. I want to be full of action. That's what the book of Acts is about. From the beginning of time, God expected man to take care of the earth. He expected him to plow the field, sow the seed, water it, didn't he? Hoe it and harvest it. God's not going to do all those things, but he, he expects us. He, he is the foundation of the church. He's the chief cornerstone. Praise God. And he said, up on this rock, I'm going to build my church. We have the right foundation. 
but he has left the responsibility of the church up to us. I'm glad to be a part of the end time church. And if you don't know it's end time, you need to pay attention. If you, if you get the wrong attitude, you, you can grieve. I've seen a guy standing by the road when I got gas at uh, uh, Codwell. And he had signs out there protesting against the president. <laughs> Said, this is his gas prices. I love them. But you know what? You can get so entangled in the things of the world when the Bible says evil seducers are going to wax worse and worse. The end time is going to be full of iniquity. But he said, whoever names the name of the Lord, let them depart from iniquity. We can be in the world, but not of the world. But we still have a job to do in the midst of the darkest days I've ever lived through. I'm glad to be in the church, and it's revival time. People are coming to their senses and saying, we need the church. It is a sure and a firm foundation. Praise God. He commissioned people. God took a man and he put him in the garden. In Genesis, the second chapter, he wanted him to dress and keep it. He put us in the church for a reason. We need to take care of the church. I remember ever since I was a kid, somebody said, if everybody in the church was just like me, what kind of church would this church be? Kind of corny, but it's true, isn't it? What would it be if everybody was like you? Have you ever won a soul? Man, I want to I win souls. I've tried. I've tried. I've been trying and uh, reaching for people and fishing for people. And it works if you'll do it. But the Bible says in John 4 and 1, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus... Uh, baptized not himself, but his disciples. And then the Bible says that he departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. And when he got there, there was Jacob's well there, near a partial ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And, and Jesus was sitting on the well, and he sent the disciples downtown to buy something to eat. And here comes this woman to the well. And when she came to the well... The Bible says he began to ask her, how about giving me a drink of water? And she said, you Jews don't have any dealings with us Samaritans. How askest thou to give me a drink of water? He said, woman, if you knew the gift of God and who saith unto thee, give me a drink, you would ask of me and I'd give you living water. You'd never thirst again. But I like the prior scripture where it says he must needs go through Samaria. God is very strategic. And he purposely went there at that well on that day, at that time of day, because he knew she was going to be coming down to the well to get a drink of water. The woman left her pitcher. She she drank and was made richer. Remember that song? Of that living water, Lord, and it came not from the well. Man, she got a drink and she ran downtown. And she said, you got to see a man that's told me all I've done. Surely he must be the Messiah. She brought a crowd back to the well with her. And the Bible says they listened to Jesus and many believed because of what Jesus said, but a lot of people believed because what the woman said. You have a powerful testimony and you cannot keep it to yourself. Praise God. I like what it said. She left her pot at the well. Praise God. You know what we need to be? We need to become apostolic, don't we? Apostolic in doctrine, Pentecostal in experience, and holiness in living. We have a direction that we need to take. Praise God. Uh, There was a tourist one time. He stopped by another farmer's story. He stopped by the farmer. He's sitting on the porch, and he said, Was there any great men born here? He said, no, just babies. (laughs) You're not born great, but you can be great. Praise God. You're not born a mature, soul-winning child of God, but when you come to God, you you can become 
a powerful witness for the kingdom of God. Peter was an ignorant, unlearned fisherman. The Bible says they knew that they were ignorant, but they had to take knowledge that they had been with Jesus. If you want to win people to the Lord, you need to get close to Jesus, and it'll shine. You don't even have to tell them that you're a Christian. They'll know you're a Christian. Somebody was telling a story about a lady. Her, her son went in the army, and he came out, and, and somebody asked him, or she asked him, she said, uh, uh, did anybody give you trouble over being a Christian? She said, he said, oh, I just didn't tell nobody I was a Christian. <laughs> How many's ever ever not told anybody and it told on you? I remember Debbie and I rented from a man in North Carolina. He said, you're a religious man, aren't you? Well, I hope somebody can see that. I don't talk the way I used to talk. I don't walk the way I used to walk. You know, there's something about living for God that makes you different. You're called out from the world. You're separate. You're distinctively different than other people in the world because you've been bought with a price that no man should ever, that could ever pay. Praise God. What, what, should be, what should be our focus? The Bible says in Matthew 10, these 12, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost house of Israel and go and preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely give, freely receive. He gave them a charge to go and preach and win people to the kingdom of God. And later when Peter was on the rooftop and the sheep came, sheep came down, or the sheet came down, did I say that right? Sheet. It came down, and he seen beasts there. He seen beasts and that, that a Jew couldn't eat and all this mess. And the Lord told him to rise, kill, and eat. And he said, nothing unclean's ever entered my mouth. And what he was saying, he finally said, there are some men at the gate. You go with them. And he got down there, and it was those dirty, stinking Gentiles that weren't even allowed to be a part of the kingdom of God. God opened the door to the Gentile nation. Aren't you glad? Praise God. It's our job to tell anybody about somebody that can save everybody. We have an awesome job. Praise God. And we have to learn to walk by faith. We can't make excuses. And I've heard people make excuses ever since I've been in the ministry. The Bible says, say not there's yet four months and then cometh the harvest. But behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they're white, all ready to harvest. Everything that's been invented, there's been somebody that said, I thought about that. I actually thought, had a great idea one time, and I never pursued it. And uh, it wasn't, I don't know, a year or two, somebody came out with the same thing that I'd told my wife about prior. Whose fault is that? Praise God. I should have got a patent on that. I might have had some money in my pocket right now. <laughs> but we need to learn, according to Hebrews 6, to walk by faith. But without faith, it's impossible to believe God. I want to believe that I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. I believe I can be a soul winner. I believe I can. I can do all things. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's a sacrifice to become a soul winner. It costs money to become a soul winner. Debbie and I spent $10,000 the first year in Salt Lake feeding people in our home. They couldn't get home in time for dinner, so we'd have them come for Bible study, and she'd fix a meal, and we'd have the table lined up with all kinds of people. She'd feed them with food, and I'd feed them with the Word. Next thing you know, I was baptizing them in the swimming pool in the hotel. God was filling them with the Holy Ghost when they came out of the water. It cost. 
You folks help pay for it. We didn't waste your money. We spent it on winning souls. Praise God. It's going to take time and money, and you got to have confidence. We have to not be conformed to, be to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we might know what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's his perfect will to be a soul winner. The very purpose of Jesus coming, for the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. That was his purpose, praise God. We need to establish our priorities because good intentions are not enough. Praise God. We need to discover how natural it can be to win a soul. When it becomes habit forming, you can't live without it. To learn to be enthusiastic about winning souls. And the Bible teaches us that the, the Lord will add to the church daily as such as should be saved. You believe God's on your side? I believe God's on your side. Praise God. And he'll set up, he'll set it up where he will let you meet people that need him. Praise God. Because we just can't have good intentions. We have to learn to be effective. Let me give you a 17-year study from the Institute of American Church Growth. The reason for primary church membership. Number one, People that have special needs brings about 1% to 2% uh, of people that come to church. People that just walk in the door, 2 or 3%. People that come just because they like the pastor, and that, that's like 5 or 6%, according to their study. Outreach brings up to 2%. Sunday school, 4 or 5%. Evangelism, about a half a percent to 1%. Church programs and plays, 2 to 3%. Friends and family, 75 to 90% of the people that come to church are because they're a friend or they're a family. I think we need to make some friends, don't you? And I think we need to reach out to our family because that's the most uh, productive way that you can win a soul in the kingdom of God. Praise God. Look how they did in the Bible. The Bible says in, in Luke 8 and 39, Return to thine own house and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done for, unto him. So Legion went to his house. He went to his friends. He went to his town. And people came out the next time Jesus came. The first time they said, Depart from us. Because their hogs ran down the hill and committed suicide in the ocean. But the next time they gladly received Jesus because Legion was a powerful man of testimony. They might not believe your doctrine, but they'll believe your testimony. They can't resist your testimony. They couldn't resist Apostle Paul's testimony. In John 4 and 53, the nobleman's house. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth and himself and his whole house believed. They went house to house, Cornelius' house. When Peter went down after that vision and he preached to Cornelius, his whole household was saved. He brought them all in and Peter preached to his household. You see, they didn't have a church building like we have today, but they went house to house. And if you want to be an effective soul winner, you've got to start going house to house. I believe, I believe it's, uh, that you can get a Bible study. Acts 16 and 15, Lydia's house. And when she was baptized and her household, praise God. I had somebody tell me, I want my family saved. I just don't want them saved in our church. You must really not like your family to feel like that. I remember when my dad came to God. He had been a backslider for years. And I remember when he came to God. It was the joy of the household when dad came to the altar and repented and God filled him with the Holy Ghost. And my brothers and, and sisters and cousins and uncles, 
I want to see them all come to the Lord. How about you? Praise God. Just, just last week in Ripley, uh, there was a young man came, and a uh, week before, I think, he came, and, and, uh, and he had some terrible situations, but, but he came to the altar, and he was baptized, and God filled him with the Holy Ghost. The next week, he brought his sister, and she came up for prayer, and pastor said, what do you want the Lord to do for you? She said, I just want to get right with God. Man, he laid hands on her for the geo. She started speaking in tongues. Andrew brought Simon Peter. Look what happened. You don't know. You might not become a preacher or a missionary, but the person you bring might. When you go in their house and, and, or they come into your house and sit around your table and you begin to open the Word of God and share with them a good Bible study, Man, you don't know whose lives that you're changing. The Bible says, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in the house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. Talking about the jailer in Acts 16. They went to the jailer's house and they baptized him and all of his household. You ought to try going to your neighbor's house and giving them a Bible study. Praise God. Acts 18 and 7. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice. And one worshiped God whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his house. So you've got Justice and you've got Crispus. They went to their houses and shared the word of the Lord. And they were converted and became a part of the apostolic church because somebody knocked on their door and went into their house. Do you know, I don't remember the sister's name that at uh, Crooksville. The one where the family, uh, they do the music and you know who I'm talking about. My wife knocked on her door. When we went to Crooksville and started that church and we door knocked the whole city with some of you folks and my wife knocked on her, her door and she came to Crooksville and there was about 35 of you helping me there. Sister Martha was the hostess and, and uh, some of the other ones were teachers. She didn't know that she was the only person in Crooksville in that church. We strategically set her up, didn't we? The Bible says we need to be uh, harmless as doves and sly as serpents, right? You've got to be smart. How do you get a Bible study? I told one guy, I said, you know, you're one of the most intelligent men I've ever met. And I have this Bible study I'd like to share with you. I'd like to get your opinion. Yeah, I'll do that. Praise God. I seen one guy, I seen my barber, he was sitting studying when there wasn't anybody's hair to cut. And he had his Bibles and his book. And I, I went to get my hair cut. I said, hey, I see you like to study the Bible. And I asked him what church he went to, and he told me. And, and I told him, I said, uh, you know, I have this Bible study. I'd like to get an opinion from a man that goes and I named his denomination. He said, I could do that. I said, no, we're really not supposed to do that. And my wife can't come. But uh, they showed up. He showed up and she was with him. Man, we, we, we had one of the greatest Bible studies I've ever had. I'm telling you what, you, that's not being dishonest. Well, I got this Bible study I'd like to teach you. See, you're making them feel inferior already. You've got to teach a Bible study like a friend to a friend, not a teacher to a student. <laughs> I had a young preacher in the church one time, and, and after he preached, I said, I, need, I need to see you in the office. And we went in the office, and I said, you know what I seen when you were up there tonight? He said, no, what? I said, all I seen was you. People don't come to see you. They come to see Jesus. 
And every message that you preach should let people see Jesus. Every handshake, every smile, every testimony. Some people are so negative, they don't want to feel better because they're afraid if they feel better, they'll actually feel worse because they like to feel bad. Are you going to follow a, a sad Sally around all the time? Negativism? I don't like negativism, do you? I like positive people. <laughs> Praise God. One lady was so jealous of this couple one time. She said, they have everything. I said, you know they lost their 12-year-old child? They've been through a lot of bad things. Just because they keep a smile on their face and a song in their heart, man, there's more things to make you happy than a paycheck. I've got Jesus. Praise God. All my life, he's been faithful. I can tell people that. All my life, he's been so, so good. With every step that I'm able, I want to sing and preach and be thankful for the goodness of God Almighty because I've got something that's worth sharing with the world. They don't have joy and they don't have peace and they don't have contentment. They're not satisfied. But I'm here to tell you, you can get satisfaction in God's house. I love it when I'm sitting around the table sharing a Bible study and I see the lights come on in their eyes. <laughs> I didn't know it when, when your pastor was growing up and we lived in that big old white house beside the church and and I'd have people constantly, they actually wore all the varnish off the floor of my house. So many people came in my house. And uh, I'd be sitting around the table sharing a Bible study. And, and right around the corner was the steps that went up to the second story. And he would be sitting there on the steps listening to me teach a Bible study. <laughs> and he told me, he said, Dad, I was thinking... One day I want to be a Bible study teacher. I love it when I call him and I say, where are you at? He said, well, I'm just leaving a Bible study. With this large church, he still teaches Bible study on a regular basis. But he said, Dad, I would sit there and I think, here it comes. Here it comes. And always and ever, just, well, about always and ever, when I'd get to the part where where God sent Philip to the desert to preach to the eunuch. And I say, you're not here by chance today, but God has put us together. And the Holy Ghost would fall and they would start weeping. What well, long we went to the baptistry, baptized him in, in Jesus' name. Praise God, I want to be a soul winner. How about you? Acts 2, 46, and they continued daily in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. You need to get in some houses. Sometimes they're not pleasant. I've taught Bible studies in some of the most filthiest places that you could imagine. Roaches crawling on the refrigerator in the daylight. I've had them to drop roach clips where they were smoking their dope, and, and I'd find them in my house. One of the Spanish guys said, Pastor, you know what that is? You better get that out of your house right now. And I looked, and one of the babies was sucking on one of those uh, crack pipes. That was two crack pipes that we found in our house, and the baby was sucking on a crack pipe. But I've been in their houses, and they fed me stuff that, when they turned their head, I dropped it in the trash after one bite because I couldn't stand whatever it was they were feeding me. The next day, I took pizza the next week. I said, I brought pizza today. Yes. <laughs> Cost me. Cost me, but I've ate things I didn't even know what I was eating before. But I'm telling you what we need to do. We need to extend our extended family. Are you friendly? Are you friendly? I went into the Chinese restaurant when I started Parkersburg Church, and, and uh, I learned to say thank you in Chinese. 
And they, they brought me my drink, and I said, Shia, Shia. <laughs> and she just smiled. She came back the next time. I says, gracias, senorita. <laughs> she said, de nada. I mean, just instantly she answered me in Spanish. <laughs> and I looked. It was all kinds of Chinese heads looking around. After she went back, there was all kinds of them looking. <laughs> and they were smiling, you know. I guess hardly anybody's friendly with them. But the Bible says if you want to have a friend, you got to be friendly. Be a good tipper. Don't be stingy. Man, I tell you what, they argue over whether they're going to get to wait on me or not. What's a few more dollars? I want them to be happy when I come in. I was, I joined, uh, I went to the Biscuit World down in Golly Bridge, and, and I'd go there in the mornings about 6 o'clock in the morning, and I became friends with the whole crowd. The mayor was there, the, the state road workers, the people that, that worked at the power plant, and, and all kinds of people, a variety were there. And I'd go in every morning and, and drink coffee with them and, and talk to them. Somebody said, you go up there with those filthy mouth guys? I said, they're never filthy mouth when I'm here. But I watched the preacher come in one day. They said, ugh. I hope he don't stay very long. When I left and went to Salt Lake City, those big burly guys, I could see tears running down their eyes. They fixed me a chocolate cake at 6 o'clock in the morning. They had it made, chocolate cake. I come home and I was going. She said, what's wrong? I said, chocolate cake and coffee. I'm... You know, but you can tell if people love you or not. There's a woman used to come to church and she said, that's when they testified. She'd stand up and say, I thank God I'm a Christian. Her brother-in-law, I work with him, he said, man, he named her name. He said, if she makes it, I'm a drunk and I ain't going to have any problem. You remember the song, if you're happy, notify your face. Take that frown off and put a smile in its place. A smile will go a long, long way. Nobody wants to hear anything from an old sourpuss. <laughs> Praise God. We need to learn that it can be natural being friendly with people. We need to be receptive of the here. Find out what's important to them. Most people, they just want somebody to hear them. It allows, if you go into the home or, or, or you allow them into your home, it, it, it allows for a no pressure sharing of the Word of God. They feel pressured when they come in the house of God. But if, if you go to their home and teach them a Bible study, and then when they decide to come to church, they know you. You build a bridge between yourself and them, and they can even come and sit by you in church. They feel comfortable. I've had a lot of people in my home, Mormons and heathens and majors in the Air Force, doctors, just common folk. Praise God, and I build a bridge between myself and them and, and they love and respected my wife and me because we treated them like they were equal to us I don't expect people to measure up instantly when they come to the house of God I heard somebody I know somebody that told the little kids that came to vacation Bible school told the little girl said if you can't wear a dress tomorrow don't come back anymore It ain't the way you win people to God. <laughs> David, David said, oh, I hope this is not online. He announced the work day at church. He said, a bunch of babes showed up in, in uh, yoga tights. <laughs> he said, good grief, Dad. That's the only people that came to help. 
They wanted to work. They didn't know any better. They don't know any better. <laughs> but I'm not going to run them off just because they don't know any better. <laughs> but I, I, want, I want people to know that, that, that uh, church people know how to love people. <laughs> that we care about people. Praise God. You can win an entire family by just winning one person. Praise God. And it's a natural support system once they come to God if they're a friend or a family. They don't just have to go back out to that old way of life and their old friends because now they're connected to you in the house of God. I mean, people, I've seen them measure up. Nobody even say anything to them, but it didn't take no time for them to measure up because they had spent time in the home of people that lived for God and they seen that their life was different. Praise God. And I'm telling you what it does, it provides contacts for more Bible studies. Your visitors list at the church, that's one of the most powerful places to find contacts because they are interested or they wouldn't come to church. Man, and, and can you imagine if only a third of the people here taught a Bible study and won one person and that person brought their whole family? What kind of crowd? That's how churches grow. In Glen Ferris, I, people would come in and visit and, and I'd meet them at the door and I usually the second time they came, I would say, uh, and I'd, I'd tell them about, I like to share a Bible study with them. It's very informative. It's non-pressure. And they say, oh, oh uh, uh, Brother Kenny's already set that up with me, or, or Brother Scott's already set that up with me, or Brother Aaron's already set that up with me. And I was so proud. I couldn't hardly get a Bible study because they were stealing them all from me. <laughs> That's when it's working. That's when it's working, when you don't have to do everything, but you have people. Praise God. We need to c concentrate on our extended family, don't we? You want to see your kin people saved? Let me tell you what to do to your kin people. You say, man, I, I, am, I am trying to learn to teach a Bible study. Can I practice on you? Now, unless they hate you, they're going to say, sure. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> so important. Then when you get in their house, don't overstay. The Bible says, remove your foot from your neighbor's house, lest they be wearied with you. You're not there to eat. The Bible says also, put a knife to your throat. You know what that means? It means quit eating so much when you go to people's houses. Praise God. And they want you to eat something, so we would drink a cup of coffee and eat a snack, but we, we would get out, we'd do about a 45-minute Bible study, and we'd stay about an hour, an hour and five minutes, and then we'd excuse ourselves and go, because I guarantee you, you might think they're happy you being there for two hours, but they, they're going to cancel Bible study on you because they don't want company that long. Companies like fish. If it hangs around too long, it starts stinking. <laughs> this is not a preaching session. This is a teaching session. <laughs> you can't be stingy. Some people are so stingy, they wouldn't give a nickel, a nickel to see an ant eat a bell of hay. One farmer and his wife came to the fair one day and they was given airplane rides for, for uh, $10. And he, he told the pilot, he said, my wife and I want to go up, but you're already gone, so you shouldn't charge my wife anything. He said, you're going anyway. And he kept arguing until the pilot said, all right, all right. On one condition, he says, what? What's the condition? He said, that you don't make a sound all while I'm flying. If you cannot, if you don't make a sound, he said, 
you can only pay $10. He said, okay. He said, man, he did flips and twirls. And <laughs> said he was shocked it didn't make any sound. Said he finally landed in the airplane and said, he told the guy, he said, you have earned your free ride. He said, I couldn't believe it, especially when I did the flips that you didn't say anything. He said, well, I almost did when my wife fell out back there. <laughs> Now that's stingy, isn't it? <laughs> Might cost you a pizza or some tacos. It's worth it. <laughs> I better quit before I get. Poor pastor calls on my phone while I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God that I have two amazing Bible study preach, teaching sons. So happy. Lakin teaches Bible study. I don't know about Lakin. Lakin, I don't know about you. She jumped out of an airplane, 18,000 feet. What's wrong with you, girl? out of a perfectly good airplane. Your pastor was going to do it one day. I said, are you going to take a chance on losing your ministry just to jump out of a perfectly good airplane? What if the chute doesn't open up? You know, he didn't jump. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm not preaching tonight. At least you got to laugh. Let's stand. I'm actually going to pray for you that God's going to God's going to let a burden fall on, on your heart because there is nothing comparable to teaching a Bible study and then that person coming down to an altar of repentance and you praying with them and God fills them with the Holy Ghost and you know you're responsible. I've held the hand of people that were taking their last breath and I watch the heart monitor when their heart, when they quit breathing and that heart just keeps beating for about 10 minutes. And I held their hand with tears in my eyes, thanking God that I got to teach them and baptized them in Jesus' name and prayed them through the Holy Ghost. Brother Gio, knowing that he was in the arms of the Almighty God, because I had a part in sharing the word of God. Ain't nothing like that. You can't buy anything like that. There was a guy that had been backslid for 30 some years. He used to be a preacher. And he had a car wreck and found out he was full of cancer. And I went to his house. A whole lot can be done in the house. He and I prayed. He prayed back through. And he said, you know, I thank God that I had that car wreck. And I thank God that I had cancer. He said, if I hadn't had a car wreck, I would have never known I had cancer and I would have died lost. But he gave me enough time to get right. And I baptized him in Jesus' name. I preached his funeral. I preached his funeral on the prodigal that came back home. When I get to heaven... I'm going to have some Sudanese back there. I'm going to have some Ethiopians and people from El Salvador and, and Mexico and all kinds of places in the world that sit around my table. Praise God. Share the word of God. One guy told me, he said, I ain't letting nobody come in my house. I said, well, that's, that's up to you. My house is my haven. That's up to you. We didn't have a church, so we just had our house. But I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't trade that for anything. We had a good time, didn't we, honey? And I always think about, I've told you about that little Spanish woman, about four foot eleven. The last service I preached in Salt Lake City. 
and she came to the altar. Debbie and I had shared a Bible study. Debbie babysitted her children while I taught her a Bible study around the table. And, and uh, she came to the altar, and I prayed her through the Holy Ghost. And she got up speaking in tongues, and, and she wrapped her arms around me and smeared makeup all over my cream-collared jacket. That's a special moment to me. And I looked at Debbie, she was on the keyboard, I said, that's revival right there, baby. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> Nothing like being a soul winner. Nothing like being a soul winner. And I've told you stories, I've preached here for a long, long time, over the years, but I've told you stories about how God helped me win people did bizarre things to get people. And I still had people to call me up and say, I love you. Or text me in the mornings or message me in the mornings and say, good morning. Just wanted to tell you I love you today. That's warm and fuzzy right there. Knowing that they're in the church because I got to share a Bible study. One woman told me one day, she said, you know, I still have the notes where you taught my husband Bible study in the coal mines. He was the boss. And I, I had time in between. I had a great job. The title was so amazing, Rock Thumper. 16-pound <laughs> sledgehammer, and I beat rock all day long. I had to beat them into small pieces so they wouldn't clog the belt up on its way out. But I had my Bible there, and I'd read my Bible. And he'd come down, and he'd say, what are you reading? I said, oh, I was reading in the book of Acts about all those people getting the Holy Ghost. <laughs> he'd just started another church, and their church were let out. And it was so short and let out so early that he'd come to our church. Next thing you know, he was in the altar. And man, he got baptized even in his wingtip shoes. I preached revival and him and his family came and his wife came to the altar and got the Holy Ghost. And then she brought her sister and she got the Holy Ghost and her husband, he got the Holy Ghost. And then another one, they got the Holy Ghost. You know what? It just spreads when you got something good. People want to know what's happened to you. Man, just go house to house. I'm telling you what, it is the apostolic way. I'm going to pray for you right now. Let's bow our heads. Lord, God, I speak faith in the greatest name that's ever been spoken on the lips of mortal man. In the name of Jesus, I pray for this church family that you would inspire them, God, and touch their hearts and their minds. Help them, Lord, to have a desire to win somebody to the kingdom. I know you're able, Lord. You're gracious and you're kind, and it's your will for us to be so winners. Help us to study to show ourselves approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. But you said if we'd pray for wisdom, you would give us wisdom because you're a liberal giver of wisdom. And I pray that you would pour it out on this congregation tonight. In the glorious name of Jesus, amen. Praise God. I want to pray for the brother that has carpal tunnel. Come on up here, brother. I can very see you back in the sound booth. Come on up. I want to pray for you. God healed me a carpal tunnel. I don't have any scars. Do you know where the oil is, Brother Nehemiah? I feel the Holy Ghost tonight. Whew. You know what I found out? God's no respecter of persons. If He can heal me, well, that's nothing for him to heal, to heal him. I told the Lord, I lost my wallet yesterday. And everything in it, credit cards, driver's license. I went up on a farm looking. And I just said, God, ain't nothing too hard for you. Finding a wallet is a little simple thing. You can let me find it. And I, I rode up to check up on the, on the hill there, and I was... David called me on the phone, and I was just coasting down without the motor running. And I said, David, there's my wallet laying right in the grass. I hadn't been over there. I don't. 
I was, I was out this morning looking at an apple tree in my yard. I've got three apple trees in a row, crab apple trees. And in the spring, they said, it's going to frost the next two nights. I laid hands on that apple tree. And I said, God, in Jesus' name, don't let the frost kill these apples. You ought to see it. They're hanging everywhere. The limbs are about to break out. Mm. I go out and sometimes during the day and pull apples off to feed the deer at night. I mean, there's thousands of apples. I didn't pray for the other two. They only had two or three apples on them. I told Debbie, I said, I should have prayed for those trees too. <laughs> I'm telling you, prayer works. Yes, yes, yes. Woo, I feel the Holy Hallelujah. Ghost. Hallelujah. Give me some more yes, oil. Yes, I'm going to wipe it off. God in Jesus name Woo, I feel you right now Lord and you're the healer touch his wrist God and release those tendons clear out that tunnel God clear it up Lord cause his hands to be free we speak faith in Jesus name Hallelujah. Can you shout hallelujah tonight? Hallelujah. hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's give him a good hand praise tonight. <laughs> praise God. Brother Nehemiah is coming to dismiss us in prayer tonight. Woo, I feel the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Let's praise his name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, just lift your voice for a moment. God, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, God, that you've given us, Lord, the power of the Holy Ghost and everything that we need to win a soul. Oh, God, we love you tonight. We thank you for the house of God. We believe, Lord God, the miracle that just taken place, God. We praise you in advance, Lord. We give you glory. We give you honor, Lord Jesus. We love you tonight, oh God. Hallelujah. Come on, love on the Lord just for a moment. Would you do that? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Give them courage and boldness, God. Help them not to be afraid when you ask them to reach out to somebody. Cover them and quicken them with your strength, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for tonight. Bless your people, Lord as they leave this house, but not from your presence. And Lord God, we love you. Everyone said in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.